you're starting to see the, the beginnings of what we describe in the book as the, uh, the commercial development of space. And once that takes off, it could be sooner than we think. Welcome to Free Colorado News, I'm Ari Armstrong. Recently I interviewed Thomas James, author of the novel about Mars, In the Shadow of Ares. The name of the book is In the Shadow of Ares. It's A-R-E-S, not A-R-I-E-S, like a constellation. So In the Shadow of Ares, and it's the story of a 14-year-old girl uh, who lives on Mars. She is the first and only child on Mars. And it's her coming-of-age story, where she decides she needs to prove herself to the adults that she's, that she's a grown-up, even though she's only 14. Uh, so she sets about solving a mystery that then imperils the entire uh, settlement of Mars. I'm an engineer at Lockheed Martin and I work on the Orion program which is the replacement for the space shuttle and I've worked there for a bit over 13 years on manned space mainly, uh, advanced programs, research and development type programs, but, but mostly mostly manned space related things. There is a media company on Mars in the story and the bad guy, the bad guys in the story are the provisional government. They're, they're very controlling, they try to plan everything Thing, get everybody's business, um, and this this media company is basically at their beck and call, and they're the only media company at the start of the book because everybody else is busy trying to make money, trying to get their settlements up off the ground, be, become self-sufficient, make a buck because that's what that's what capitalism is about. Yeah, doing. Yeah. Building a service, providing providing a useful service or products to people, making money at it, and you know, benefiting everybody else in the process. And the toward the end of the story, one of the one of the characters realizes that they need their own media company to get out the word about what's really going on. That as long as the provisional government controls the story that's getting back to Earth and is controlling everything that Earth knows about what's going on on Mars, they will never be able to fight back against this provisional government and its successes. So they cobble together their own their own news network. We wrote this up probably around 2002, 2003 is where the idea for Kipu, which is the, the, the name of the, the news company, where that came from. And later on, 2008, we started Pe People's Press Collective for much the same reasons. As a matter of fact, we did aim it toward kids um, to get some of these ideas in front of kids that they're not seeing from other sources. Uh, the inspiration for writing the book in the first place was watching a panel of science fiction authors at a convention speaking about uh, how the their generation, they, they all tended to be a little bit older, um, how their generation was inspired to go into math and science careers, to go you know, to develop space, to, to work on Apollo and Space Shuttle, um, by writers such as Heinlein, Asimov, and Clark, who talked about hard science. They, they had real science, not make-believe, not fantasy, and real mathematics. I mean, how, how many Heinlein stories hinge on a character knowing something about mathematics? that somebody else doesn't and it saves the day by you know right now solving some differential equations um, and somehow he managed to make that interesting uh, but there, there really isn't that kind of science fiction out right now that focus on Harry Potter and you know there's nothing wrong with Harry Potter he's got his good philosophical points as, as you well know um, in Harry Potter but it's not driving people in kids into math and science groups it's not you know, getting them to think rational, you know, about about things rationally, logically, the way you would, do, would with science. So we, we wanted to fill that niche. We wrote a story that was intentionally directed at the young adult audience, and put in there things that you might you might otherwise come across, or kids might come across later on if, if they read Atlas Shrugged, for instance. That you know, capitalism is good, honesty is good, reason, integrity—they're all good things, um, and if you follow these these good principles, that everything works out good in the end. That if you try to cheat, if you lie and steal, then things are going to turn out badly. 
And along the way, we throw in lessons about economics, not just capitalism is good, but why capitalism is good, and how things work. We explore, um, partly for education purposes, partly because it's kind of an interesting topic, how you would set up a brand new economy on a blank slate planet. And we talk a little bit about that. We get, we'll get it, we have two sequels planned. We'll get a into that a little bit more in the sequels, show a little bit more of the background of how the settlements came to be on Mars. And beyond that, there are little bits and pieces that we throw in of specific technologies that a lot of people are afraid of, like genetically modified organisms. Uh, everybody on Mars is dependent on genetically modified food to grow in the Martian environment. One of the settlements that we feature, they make a lot of money off of their genetic modifications. They're, they're, they're experts at it. They refine uh, minerals. They, they, they take minerals and metal, metals, useful things, out of the soil of Mars using bacteria that's genetically, um, genetically engineered. So they don't need massive, polluting, heavy industry like you picture you know, from a hundred years ago, in Pittsburgh or, or wherever, you know, polluting the skies and polluting the rivers. No, it's, it's very benign because they tailor, they tailor microbes to do all the work for us. Nuclear power. Nuclear power is a central plot element of the book. Nuclear power is good. And the, the people in the story are very cognizant of the fact that they can't they can't live on Mars without nuclear power. That solar and wind still work. So we, we pre present these things that scare a lot of people in a positive light so that you know kids will have another perspective on some of these issues that they're going to be confronted with as adults. We met through the Mars Society, which is a space advocacy group that specifically adv advocates for the settlement of Mars. Um, and we were, we were the co-founders of the Louisiana chapter of the Mars Society when, when we both lived in Louisiana uh, about eight, nine years ago. And after this conference, we decided we were going to write, write this book. Well, a few weeks later, Carl up and moves to Houston. So we had to come up with some way to collaborate long distance. And we started using the internet. This was, I, I hate to say it's been this long, but this was in August of 2001 when we came up with this idea. It was two, exactly two weeks before 9-11. And that's when blogs started coming out. I'd never heard of a blog before 9-11. And after that, we thought, hey, that's a great collaborative environment. So we set up a private blog. It was password controlled. And we would pass ideas, uh, blocks of text that we would write, character development, settings, you know, you name it. As we were developing the book, we were sharing these things back and forth. So we had this huge database of backstory, of setting, of development information for how we came, how we built up the book, how the book came, progressed from idea to, to realization over eight years. Uh, beyond that, we uh, he was in Houston, I was in New Orleans, so we'd go back and forth about every six weeks and spend a weekend in person working on the book. Um, and we, we continued doing that on a little bit less frequent schedule after I moved up to Colorado because it, you know, it's a little harder to get up here. Uh, but by then we had the, the bones of the story laid out so it was very easy for us to just take the text, divide it in three, and swap chapters back and forth. And then set, swap whole sections of the book back and forth and edit, fill in the blanks, polish what each other had written, and ultimately we put it together into to one whole and we've edited it probably three or four times each, going through smoothing it out so that it is one consistent, continuous story. Uh, we have all the technology to do that that we need right now. All the basic technology is there. It's been there since, it's really since Apollo. We've just improved on it since then. Uh, we, we can get there, we can live there. The thing is, we've, we've got, it's like knowing all the lessons or let's say, say knowing how to uh, to hit a golf ball. 
and knowing what a hole in one is, but never having practiced before. You have you have the clubs, you have the balls, you have the course, but you don't have the skills yet because we haven't done it. So what it'll take is maybe 10, 15, 20 years of progressively going further away from Earth, going to the moon, going to the asteroids. Once we are con uh, once we are confident that we have the technology that is reliable for long periods of time and will you know, provide us what we need to stay alive and possibly just go there one way and stay, then we'll be able to do it. But there's nothing stopping us right now except for just a willingness to commit to doing it and, of course, the money. But as, as time goes on, these things have gotten cheaper as well as, you know, all the technology was there during the Apollo days. It's gotten better and cheaper since then. And you're starting to see things kind of accelerate with the commercial space programs like SpaceX and uh, uh, Virgin Galactic. You're starting to see the, the beginnings of what we describe in the book as the, uh, the commercial development of space. And once that takes off, it could be sooner than we think.